Good morning. It is so good to be here again, and I'm delighted for the opportunity, and I want to thank those that were responsible for that for giving me yet another opportunity. And I pray that as we have our time together, that it might be an encouragement to you, but likewise, as we have our time together, as we are confronted with the Word of God, that we will do and desire to be obedient and do what the Lord wants us to do. And I love that song just prior to the message here, Give of Your Best to the Master. That is, I pray, our desire that the Lord would have the best of us. Take your Bibles, please, and join with me for a moment or so in the book of Mark. We'll look at the book of Mark, go to another passage uh, as we uh, share from God's Word and then come back to Mark. Mark chapter 13. Would you join me there? Mark chapter 13. We are in that portion of Scripture commonly known as the Olivet Discourse. Both Matthew has a uh, reference to this as well as Luke, the Olivet Discourse. And with that, please go down to verse 29. Mark chapter 13, verse 29. So ye in like manner. What's the like manner? Verse 28. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When you see our branches yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So the Lord recommends, so ye in like manner, when ye see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verse 30, Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man in his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Verse 35, watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at evening, or at midtime, at night, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. The Lord ending this at verse 37, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Would you bow with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for the Abundant Life Baptist Church. And Father, as previously prayed, we thank you for the lighthouse that it has here in this community. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to allow this lighthouse to prosper, to glow in such a way that would bring honor and glory to you. Father, as we've heard the announcements up uh, coming up here shortly, business meetings and business matters that a church tends to. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would allow great discernment and wisdom as the church goes forward in this next year. And Father, that sobering aspect likewise of looking for a pastor as we pray during the Sunday school hour. I pray that you would uh, lead and direct in that matter. And so, Likewise, we ask that you would bring to this church a man that would be used of you in a mighty way to continue to shepherd the flock here and to bring them into the grace and admonition and continue to do that, the grace and admonition of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the gathering today. Today is the Lord's Day. And every Sunday we thank you for and we remember what Jesus Christ accomplished there on the cross for us, his death, his burial. And Father, that Sunday, the reminder of the resurrection. And Father, that's the elements of the gospel that we wish to make known. And I pray that if there's anyone here that may not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that by faith that they would trust in him as their Savior. And Father, the promise of your word is, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. We pray that you would grant your salvation to those that may be outside the fold. 
And I pray, Father, that they by faith would trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Thank you again for our time together today. Father, I just pray that it would be profitable and that our time together would bring honor and glory to you. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The year has already been over. We're well into the new year. Can you believe it? 2023. I don't know what you think about that. Some of us were glad when 2020 was over. 2021, 2022, now 2023. And I don't know what kind of hopes that you have for 2023. I hope that I'm not too late in pleading with you perhaps to have a watchword for this year. Have you thought about that? Lord, I want to have at least something, a watchword, something to give me direction for this next year. And if I could recommend to you, perhaps suggest to you a good watchword, you see that watchword listed a number of times in the passage that we just read. That watchword can um, be found at least in verse 37 among two other places. But note here, the Lord brings to a conclusion that Ovid discourse. The disciples were asking him, what about future things? And as he explains all through this chapter about what will be down the road as far as the future, he said to his disciples, and likewise, I pray that we would understand to us, note what he says in verse 37, and what I say unto you, I say unto you all, or unto all, watch. May I plead with you, 2023 needs to be a year where you and I watch. And I pray that we watch for many, many things. I'll share with you three things, but I pray that we would know that soon coming to us may be the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation says, even so come Lord Jesus. I wanna plead with you this morning, to watch and anticipate the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord makes it clear here to all of his disciples, to all that would follow him. He says, watch. And so today I want to encourage you, are you watching? I've noted in our conversations, I've been a Baptist ever since I was saved, at least a little bit before then. But I joined the Baptist church uh, when I was a small child. I have been a Baptist, and it's not because of tradition. It's because of what the Word of God says. But I've noticed several things that creep in among us that are Baptists. We love talking about at least two things. One is food. We love food. I look forward to potluck dinners. Even today, boy, if I knew that you had donuts, I would have been here much earlier. My goodness. And those powdered donuts would not have looked good on a blue suit like this. But I love food. We all love food. Baptists are the only people I know that could be sitting down to a potluck dinner, enjoying that food, talking about the next place that we'll have food together, that restaurant or this place or that place. Food. But there's a second thing that I discovered creeping into our conversations that I'm not so sure is a good thing. And it goes something like this. Did you happen to watch and then whatever the TV show? My son-in-law lives across the street, came over to visit. He's the pastor of the church that I go to. And he said to me, are you watching this program or that program? I go to church, are you watching this? And unfortunately, because of how things are in our day and age, we have something now called binge watching. That is, armed with a a, a, a thing of popcorn, maybe soda, I can sit down and watch for an evening, whatever. Guess what? That's not the kind of watching that we're told to do in this passage. The Lord Jesus Christ wants us to watch. Several background things before we suggest three things that you and I ought to watch for. So what are the background things? As I mentioned, this is part of the Olivet Discourse. 
disciples came to Jesus. They wanted to know about last things. What's going to happen in the last days? Well, Jesus spent in his Olivet Discourse, he shared with them six major signs of the soon coming. And all those signs are not necessarily good things. We're talking about uh, wars and rumors of wars and all those kind of things. My point is not to go there today, but that's kind of what he was talking about. And those same things, those signs, are kind of almost parallel to the book of Revelation, the seals that we see in Revelation chapter 6. Here in the book of Mark, this Olivet Discourse, the Lord finishes his discourse there talking with his disciples, and he note, he shares a little parable. Verse 28, you'll see the parable. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. In other words, as you see these things, think about this parable. Verse 28 again, when her branch is yet tender and putting forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. He says, look at the natural surroundings where he was teaching. And I want to remind you that the fig tree here is uh, an indication of something is yet around the corner. As the leaves begin to develop, wouldn't you know that it soon means that spring followed by summer is near. By the way, are you hearkening for spring? We've had a mild winter. But summer is, spring is coming. I'm re being reminded of that. And summer is near. So the Lord is saying, so likewise, when you see these things, that is, those things, those signs that he was talking about, deception, war, famine, pestilence, earthquakes, much like those sealed judgments, when you see those things, we are right in the area of time where he is soon to return back to earth. And all God's people said, are you looking forward to that? Do you understand we are right there? One key verse, notice it says in verse 30, this generation shall not pass till all these things shall be done. In other words, when you see those things, the generation that is alive, that sees those things, that generation will not pass until the Lord comes again. Folks, we're right there. We are right there. And one of the things that I'm kind of concerned about is that the church, by and large, has stopped talking about the doctrine of last things. We need to talk about that. We are right there. We should, in bringing it all together, we should look for the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ for when he comes again, that grand event, the resurrection of all believers from the dead, will occur. But let me encourage you, in light of this passage that we're told at least three times to watch, I want to suggest to you this morning how to watch. Number one, how to watch. Watch persistently, all beginning with P, so that you can take it home and think about it and pray about it. Watch persistently. My job as a young person when I was growing up in my house on Saturday was to clean. At this very same time, it was my mom's day to go shopping. Think about that. I was a clean. She went shopping. When she left for shopping, I turned on the TV, watched all the Saturday morning cartoons. I could get away with it, I thought, because I would see her car come, turn quickly the TV off, and go back to cleaning. Well, I did a mistake one day, turned on the TV, she left to go shopping. I went to grab just a bite to eat somewhere along that time, and wouldn't you know, the pink and white Plymouth, yeah, pink and white back in those days, Plymouth came into the driveway 
and I was caught unprepared. My mom stepped in and said, what's the TV doing on? My mom stepped in and said, why aren't all these things done? What happened? I wasn't watching persistently. Notice the Lord in verse 34 gives a similar kind of example. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, commanding the porter to watch. What he's saying is a man is on a long journey. He gives assignments to the various members of the household. They had various different responsibilities. He tells them to do that while he is gone. In addition to that, he tells the porter to watch. The porter was the doorkeeper. So while all the other members of the household were doing their things, they were also to watch for the return of the master who went away and coming back then from his business. It was the job of the porter to be away constantly and to constantly be looking for the return of the master. Why? So that he could alert everyone else in the house. For us today, the church is like the household of that story, the parable. Our master is the Lord Jesus Christ. Before he left to go on his long journey to heaven, he gave instructions to you and I, the local church. Matthew 28 gives us one, go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching and baptizing. Those the epistles gives us other instructions. In other words, God intended every Christian to be working until he comes again. Every Christian as well to develop in their lives a pattern of good works, Ephesians 2.10 says. God wants us to be at work while his son is away. Can I ask, what are you doing in his household? God has given every church member, I believe, once you're saved, given to you as salvation were spiritual gifts. Are you using those spiritual gifts within the ministry of the local church? The Lord has given us, gone away, as I mentioned. He's given us jobs to do, and we're to do that and be engaged in service for him until he comes again. Verse 35, note, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Can I ask, are you watching? The watch of Lord Jesus Christ talks about here is a persistent one. Stay at it. You don't know when he's coming. And as you are watching, we need to be about his business, doing what Jesus wants us to do. Note verse 36. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, or the word napping. Now, that napping doesn't necessarily have to be a literal napping. Let me share with you some forms of napping that you and I may be engaged in. If we're caught up in our own pleasures, when Jesus comes, we'll be napping. If you're worried about your own well-being, when Jesus comes, you're napping. If you're delayed in serving the Lord when he comes, thinking that you have plenty of time yet, you're napping. In other words, if you're concentrating on your business, your families, your comforts, when Jesus comes, you're napping. When Jesus comes, the intent of this passage is you really should not be surprised. Why? Because you're expecting him. You're expecting him because he told you to watch for your coming. In the closing words of this passage, Matthew 30, 13, verse 37, and what I say unto you all, Jesus says, watch. Can I plead with you today? Are you watching for his coming? Or can I plead with you? Are you engaged in so many other things that, is, it, it's, that it's all about you? 
The Lord says we need to be about his business. Second Peter chapter 3 reminds us that he's not negligent concerning his promise. Jesus is coming again. Watch persistently. The second word, watch, watch perceptively. The word perceptively, and as you do that, take your Bibles, please, and join me in Titus, the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2. The other form of watching, Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 11, I love this passage of Scripture. Note what it says. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now note this, verse 13, watching or looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Watching perceptively. There's a verse out of the Old Testament that records for us David's taking on of men so that he would have martial forces. And the verse goes something like this. And the men from the tribe of Issachar had an understanding of the times that they might know what Israel ought to do. They were watching perceptively. Perceptively means that they knew, know, they knew what was going on. Perceptively means that they sensed what was going on. Perceptively understood, they, they understood things. As we watch, perhaps through this next year, we're to watch not only persistently, but perceptively. Note in the Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men. Can I plead with you with the understanding this way? The grace of God that has appeared unto all men means all types of people. The grace of God is God's unmerited favor. Amen? Amen. Did you deserve to be saved? What did you merit for your salvation with? That grace of God is unmerited favor. God poured his love upon me, this unworthy sinner, that by his grace I came to know Jesus Christ. And same likewise for you if you're saved today. That grace of God means I don't deserve God's forgiveness for my sin. That grace of God means I don't deserve a place in heaven. That grace of God means I don't deserve to be a child of God. But if you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe that he died for your sins and you're trusting him for forgiveness and eternal life, guess what? The grace of God has touched you. Note here, if you put your faith in, in Christ, the grace of God is at work in your life. And among other things, notice here that that grace of God, verse 11, teaches us to be perceptive. Note this, the grace of God has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worthy lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, note, not only does God's grace saves us, but God's grace teaches us. Here in the passage, it teaches us, you and I, to deny ungodliness. What is ungodliness? Ungodliness is anything that God wouldn't do himself. It is anything that's not fitting or true of God. Ungodliness is also anything that we do without God. If what I am doing is not dependent upon God or approved by God, it is ungodly. How do I now go about denying ungodliness? 
I deny ungodliness by staying close to the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 15 reminds me, Abide in me, Jesus said, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. Then he explains, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Note, for without me you can do nothing. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, I am not only, and 12, not only am I to deny ungodliness, but it continues in verse 12, I am to deny worldly lust or desires. By the way, talking about watching and binge watching, denying worldly lust or desires, wouldn't that tamper our TV viewing a bit? Wouldn't we be a little bit more discerning that way? At any rate, worldly lust or desires are basically anything that I do in excess. How do I deny worldly lust? I deny worldly lust by allowing God's Holy Spirit to control me. Galatians 5 says it this way. Paul writes, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Titus 11, that grace of God not only teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, but it reminds me, verse 12 says, to live soberly, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. To be sober is to be serious. If we're to live soberly, we will live seriously, especially in the context of the message, in light of his soon coming again. That doesn't mean that we can't have a sense of humor, and boy, do we have a sense of humor sometimes but it means that I will take seriously my commitment to God. The serious Christian lives seriously practicing the things of God on a continual basis, not just Sunday morning, but at every day and moment of my life, I have a commitment to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and to daily walk with him. Back to Titus t chapter 2, again, verse 11 and 12. Not only are we to live soberly, but righteously and godly. Christian, our activities should be right all the time in the eyes of God. Our activities should be the things that God would do if he were in our situation. So bringing it all together, why does the grace of God teach us to live the teach us to live this way? Verse 13, uh, 12 and 13, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. What this means is if we live lives that deny ungodliness, if we live lives that deny worldly lust, and that we're serious, righteous, and godly, we will be perceptive, watching perceptively, we will be perceptive enough to be looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those words in verse 13, that blessed hope and glorious appearing, are one and the same. It is the one who is looking for the wonderful coming of the Lord Jesus will be perceptive to live as though he would be coming back at any moment. Christian, are you living that way? What I mean is this, going back to that silly example of my mom being away. If you understand a little bit of that, think about all those times that you expected company. Just last Sunday, I have an arched doorway in my house that needs a door. And on one side, the roof comes down, and there's no way that I can 
have a second bedroom where we are living because of that arched doorway. So I had an idea to bring somebody home from church. And so I texted my wife, I'm bringing so-and-so home from church. And she said, good, blah, 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 blah. Well, the text that I didn't get that she sent much later, but don't bring him upstairs. Why? Because we needed some organization to do yet. And so, guess who was in the doghouse? It's something like that. If you expect company, you clean up the house. If you expect Jesus, what Titus 2 is saying, you clean up your life and keep it clean on a daily basis. Looking perceptively, we're looking forward to his coming, and so you live as though he is coming at any moment. Watching persistently, watching perceptively, the last P, watching prayerfully. Take again your Bibles and go back to Mark chapter 13 for me. Note just two verses out of that. Watching prayerfully. As you turn back to Mark chapter 13, one of the most discouraging things I think I am living through is watching church after church drop prayer meeting. My son was taking classes, going to school out in California, and in the process of doing that, he uh, joined up with a local church and eventually became the associate pastor. And the pastor sat down with him, the associate, and said, listen, I'm going to give you prayer meeting. 10.30, Thursday mornings, and only the old people showed up. Folks, I, if I could plead with you, don't drop prayer meeting. Watching prayerfully. Verse 32, but of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Now note, take ye heed, he would say to his disciples, likewise to us, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. In Scripture, I believe, watching and praying go together. Jesus commands it here. It's commanded throughout the epistles. Colossians says it this way, continue in prayer. Watch in the same way with thanksgiving. First Peter says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Why does the scriptures put prayer and uh, watching and praying together? Praying helps us to have victory over temptation. Praying keeps us spiritually sharp. Praying accomplishes God's purpose before Jesus comes. John 14 says it this way, and whatsoever ye ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, and ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't want anybody to perish. So we're instructed as well in Scripture, 1 Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayer, intercessions, giving of thanks, be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. My plead, therefore, to you this morning is make watch your watchword for 2023. Watch persistently. Watch perceptively. Watch prayerfully. Shall we bow together in prayer? Heavenly Father, when we see these things, that generation will not pass. Father, you have commanded the church to be in great anticipation for your soon coming again. 
I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would allow this church to encourage one another. Are we watching persistently? May we not take our eyes off the prize of the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, may we watch perceptively, understanding the times in which we live, that surely Jesus must be coming soon. And may we watch prayerfully. Oh, Heavenly Father, teach the church, those local bodies, to pray without ceasing. And may we together encourage one another to watch and pray. Father, we talked about last things this morning, and I'm reminded that perhaps there's maybe someone here today not ready for those last things. And Father, if you come again, the earth will be plunged into a tremendous time of turmoil and tribulation. Beyond that, Father, if we die in our sin, we'll have an eternal life in hell. And I pray if there's anyone here today that may not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they will see the times in which we live and by faith simply trust in the one who first loved them and gave himself for them. Thank you again, Father, for our time together. And I pray that you allow Abundant Life Baptist Church to go forward this next year, watching in great anticipation. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.